My name is Rosa Luxemburg. It is 1912. I'm writing a book on the future of capitalism. It does not look very bright. After a short jail term for insulting the Kaiser, Rosa Luxemburg got a job teaching economics to working class socialists. What they learned was Marxism, but Marx had written Das Kapital 50 years before and capitalism had changed. A system based on small, privately owned factories had morphed into one based on huge industrial monopolies with massive financial power and strong links to the state. And the industrialized countries had seized vast colonial empires based on systematic racism and workers in a city like Berlin were even benefiting from the profits of this new system. We call it imperialism. This new kind of capitalism with the world divided into colonial empires and with a massive state and an organized economy posed new questions for socialists. Some people said maybe capitalism has stabilised and that strengthens the case for a long, slow, patient parliamentary route to power. And some even said maybe we, the workers, can benefit from imperialism. Rosa Luxemburg set out to prove that they were wrong. The accumulation of capital, a contribution to the economic explanation of imperialism, 1913. If the workers could buy every product their factories produced, she said, there would be no crisis. But the whole reason for colonial empires was to soak up the excess capital, the excess goods, the excess workers. Capitalism would go on dividing and redividing the world through colonial wars, ultimately leading to a world war. Capitalism, she said, can only live by feeding off other systems and destroying them. And once it starts to run out of new colonies, markets and new sectors to commercialise, it will destabilise. The final phase of capitalism is going to be a period of catastrophes. Now, history began to speed up. In 1914, the catastrophe Luxembourg had predicted arrived. And for the left, it brought an even bigger catastrophe. One by one, the old, male, reformist leaders of the European left fell into line to support their own army and their own war effort. But not Rosa Luxembourg. In the midst of this witch's sabbath, a catastrophe of world historical proportions has happened. International social democracy has capitulated. Luxembourg was already facing a jail sentence for inciting soldiers to resist the march to war. Jailed in February 1915, from her prison cell, she launched a ferocious attack on the war and its left-wing supporters. For the first time, the ravening beasts set loose upon all quarters of the globe by capitalist Europe have broken into Europe itself. A cry of horror went through the world when Belgium, precious jewel in European civilization, fell into shards under the impact of the blind forces of destruction. The same civilized world looked on passively as the same imperialism ordained the cruel destruction of 10,000 Herero tribesmen and filled the sands of the Kalahari with mad shrieks and death rattles of men dying of thirst. Nonetheless, the imperialist bestiality raging in Europe's fields has one effect about which the civilised world is not horrified and for which 
It has no breaking heart, and that is the mass destruction of the proletariat. The pamphlet caused outrage. Even Lenin said the descriptions of imperialism were too extreme. But Rosa Luxemburg understood something about the First World War. Not only would it kill millions of people, it would leave millions of those who survived it brutalised and traumatised in ways that would shape the century. She really shows that you cannot disengage the beating human heart from political action. And it is exactly the ability to empathise and to understand suffering and to see struggles from another's point of view that you can actually push for a revolution. So I think we need to really go beyond seeing either emotion or justice as two separate debates, something that has extended from her time to ours, arguably, and to sort of notice how she brings these emotional passages to invoke, to show people, this is how your comfortable life as German bourgeoisie is funded, and you must speak up against those horrors. The madness will cease and the bloody demons of hell will vanish only when workers in Germany and France, England and Russia, finally wake from their stupor, extend to each other a brotherly hand and drown out the bestial chorus of imperialist warmongers and the shrill cry of capitalist hyenas with labour's old and mighty battle cry. Workers of the world, unite.